afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure and honor to be part of Shanghai Forum, thanks to um, Korea Foundation for Advanced Studies and Fudan University. So today, my presentation is going to examine the extent to which China has liberalized its economy in its interaction with the international legal agreements of the WTO, World Trade Organization. And specifically through the case studies of China's trade disputes in the automobile and wind turbine industries, I demonstrate how China's industrial policy stays one step ahead of the WTO rule enforcement mechanisms through convenient compliance, hence the title of my talk. So when China joined the WTO in 2001, a lot of experts and pundits expected that China would further its economic liberalization, and China has certainly um, increased its economic liberalization. And the liberalization group of scholars highlights the role of the WTO and the multinational companies. First, the WTO and dispute settlement body, DSB, provides a rule enforcement and rule providing mechanisms while providing social environment for China's international norm adoption. Second, countries usually change their behaviors out of reputational concerns once they join the international legal agreements. And lastly, according to the political scientists such as Linda Weiss and Robert Wade, uh, the WTO rules are more restrictive for developing countries like China than developed countries by prohibiting a lot of industrial policy measures that developing countries wish to use in developing manufacturing industries. And with respect to the role of multinational companies, scholars such as Jeff Frieden and Hello Milner suggest that multinational companies are forced for liberalization serving as a liberalizing export lobbying group and calling for increasing market access in emerging economies, such as China. And empirically, China has been an important part of China's trade dispute settlement body. And since 2001, China has been part of 137 trade disputes, 11 as a complainant, 30 as a respondent on 19 different matters, and 96 as a third party. And out of those 11 com completed cases where China served as a respondent, China, the Beijing government has either reached an agreement with the complainant over the disputed practices or removed the contested measures. So China has been demonstrating a very successful compliance rate. And the w conventional wisdom views that this compliance record is a result of China's adoption of international norms of the WTO. Then, however, the problem is that if this is, the, this, this is the result of China's norm adoption, why do we not see an increase, increase, increasing use of the WTO in consistent industrial policy measures? And such China's uh, achievement is overshadowed by increasing criticism from foreign businesses and com uh, countries over the diminishing access to their Chinese market and especially U.S.-China Economic Security Review Commission and EU Chambers of Commerce have heavily criticized China for being a pay-to-play market for foreign companies, and also um, they criticize China's use of industrial policies to favor domestic companies against foreign companies, and especially the development of the state-owned enterprises. So China's such practices not only portends the comeback of state capitalism, but also provided a room for increasing trade tensions with other partners, increasing uh, over the issues of subsidies and discrimination against the foreign companies and anti-dumping and so on. So, this begs the question of how to reconcile these two different pictures. One picture, you have the successful compliance rate of China to the WTO's final ruling, but at the same time, you see an increasing use of WTO inconsistent industrial policy measures. And in the relationship, and what does this tell us about the China's ability to flout the WTO rules? or the institutional limitations of the WTO, and in the relationship between the WTO and China, who is socializing whom and who is limiting whom. So in this paper, basically, I argue that China's compliance to the WTO rulings reflect Beijing's skillful navigation through the institutional limitations of the WTO rather than the result of China's international uh, you know, successful adoption of the international standards. 
So first, unlike what Linda Weiss and Robert Wade suggest about the restrictive nature of the WTO rules for emerging economies such as China, I basically argue that China often implement industry policies liberally to achieve its economic goals and only removes them after they come into the WTO dispute. And second, China does so um, without much negative economic cost. That's why I call this practice as a convenient compliance. Because by the time China removes the challenged measures, it has either, um, it doesn't no longer need the uh, industry policy because it already achieved its developmental goals to put this industry policy measures in the first place. And it can also build up a reputation as a responsible WTO member. And I want to make sure that this is not just China who is engaging in this kind of convenient compliance. Other countries can do that too. So let me turn to explain what enables or what provides incentives for countries to engage in such a com a convenient compliance. First, I argue that the WTO's institutional limitations provides incentives for countries to engage in strategic rule breaking. The dispute settlement process is a four-stage process consisting of consultation stage, panel proceedings, appealing, and implementation stage. So if the, concept, the problem doesn't get solved during the consultation stage, which lasts for two months, once you go to the panel's proceedings, it will take minimum a year, up to six years, sometimes 10 years. So it's a long time. Second, another problem is that the main redress of the WTO's dispute settlement body is to re push the offending countries to remove the measures instead of punishing for the violation. So the redress is prospective rather than retrospective, covering only the loss as the date of ruling rather than as a date of the violation. So, if I'm an emerging economy who needs to use industry policies, of course, countries, the best strategy is to adopt industry policy in the first place and develop its economy and its industries while the dispute process is proceeding, which might take a year to six years to 10 years. And then you remove the measures once it comes into the dispute. Second, I also argue that multinational companies are not necessarily forced for liberalization. I argue that Multinational companies in China and other emerging economies implicitly or explicitly support Chinese protectionist measures because sometimes they fear of the retaliation from the Chinese government, but sometimes they are, if they are still happy and by benefiting from the ever, you know, is a smaller pieces of ever enlarging pie of Chinese trade. And another thing is the development of global supply chain definitely complicates the domestic political payoffs of involved companies over the issue of initiating trade disputes against China. So it's a misconception to think that a lot of American companies all want to sue China because a lot of them are doing, still doing the trade with China. Some of the companies, multinational companies, gain benefit from um, the protectionist measures. One of the best examples is actually Shanghai Volkswagen. And that's why if you go outside, all the text, most of the taxes in Shanghai is Volkswagen. So it's a local protectionism. And Volkswagen, it was a big favor of those kind of local protectionism. So in an um, effort to substantiate China's um, uh, compli compliance pattern, I suggest I provide two examples of recently completed WTO trade cases. First is the auto parts, China's measures affecting imports of automobile parts. This is the first WTO case that China went through the full panel process. And second is the wind turbine cases. And I chose these two cases as an indicative and representative examples of China's convenient compliance. Both of them are seen as a strategic industries. And at the same time, the Chinese government removed contested measures upon the WTO's final ruling. So first, driven away, driven away auto case. China, once called the heaven of bicycle, now is the largest auto market in the world since 2009. And who are driving this auto market development in China? It's mostly passenger market, passenger car market, and that's where the multinational companies are mostly interested. So Chinese government needed to invite multinational companies, but as a way to guarantee the benefits of multinational companies' involvement in the automotive industries, Chinese government put a very strict 
ownership regulations. So if you're GM or if you're Hyundai, if you want to have an operation in China, you have to form a joint venture with Chinese partners that is state-owned enterprises. That's why you see Shanghai GM, Shanghai Volkswagen, Beijing Hyundai, Tianjin Toyota. So these owners' regulations limit two of the most important business strategies for multinational companies. First, entry mode has to be joint venture. Second, entry timing has to be approved by the central government. Second, so besides this owner's regulations, second, um, Chinese government also put a very strict local content requirements. So automobile requires more than 20,000 parts. So it's a very complicating product. Therefore, the success of automotive industries depend on large development of supplier chain. So in order to guarantee the development of local Chinese automotive parts companies, Chinese government required these joint ventures to meet the 40% of local content by the end of the first year, leading up to 80% by the end of the third year. However, this limits the operation of multinational companies. With the w, under the WTO rule, local content requirement is not allowed. So with the, with the WTO entry, Chinese government eliminated the local content requirements. Then, what's going to do? Chinese government you know, continuously wanted to develop the local uh, parts suppliers. So Chinese government adopted a new regulation, which was that if a car has more than 60% of auto parts, imported auto parts, it was seen as a fully imported car and charged 25% of tariffs instead of 10% tariff on auto parts. So let's say if you're auto parts makers in Ontario, Ohio, Detroit, of course you are not going to be happy. So what happened was all of these angry auto parts makers went to their trade representative in the US and United, uh, European Union, and the US and U EU took this case to the WTO. And as you can see, after four years of negotiation, China finally removed this measure. So what's the result? If you look at Shanghai GM is now seen as the most, one of the most successful joint ventures in um, China and in the world as well. So after four years of dispute settlement process, if you look at the uh, interview quotes from the president of GM China, he basically said the WTO ruling is not going to make any difference for GM's operation in China because it has already localized all of its production. So, it shows that WTO rules have only marginal impact, maybe not just because China is playing smart, but also because of the institutional limitations of the WTO. Second, it also shows the diverging interest between these American companies, right? So if you're GM suppliers already located in China, you don't want another American independent auto parts makers coming into China to compete with you. So that's why I'm arguing that the development of global supply chain complicates the domestic political payoffs. So it's misleading to say uh, that American companies all share their same interest against China's industry policy. Second, blown away, wind energy. You know, people ask, what color is China? Is China red, communist country? Is China gray, if you look at the air pollution? But China is definitely green. <laughs> so China is becoming a world super green power faced with the need for environmental protection and energy independence. So now China is the largest wind power in the world. And in 2005, China has less than one gigawatt worth of wind towers. So this is literally a breathtaking development that within four years, China became the largest wind power in the world. I mean, that's the power of China. Then who are driving this wind turbine industry development? From 1990 up until 2004, 75% of Chinese domestic markets were captured by foreign companies, including Europeans and American, GE, Vestas, Gamesa, Within five years, as you can see right here, this red line is a Chinese domestic enterprises. Five years completely reversed. 75% of the Chinese wind turbine markets are captured by the Chinese companies. 
Five years. That's all you need. So what happened during those five years? Chinese government adopted new measures. So if you look at the midline, Chinese government adopted domestic content requirements, which is against the WTO rules. Also, it increased tariffs for imported components and increased subsidies for the Chinese companies so that they can continuously develop their uh, wind turbine capacity and require joint venture partnership, probably learning from the example of the automotive industry. So what's the result? Chinese companies led by Sinovel and Goldwyn controlled more than two thirds of the market share by 2008, uh, 2009, and not a single central government funded project went to the multinational companies, meaning that Chinese government is using the uh, public procurement as a way to uh, develop local companies. But America also has a Buy American Act, so it's not only limited to China. So the United States, um, United States took this case to the WTO um, and really rapidly, you know, during these two months of like consultations, Chinese government says, okay, we'll remove the measures. And what's the result? Chinese state-owned enterprises already became national champions and global champions. So fine, we don't need this special fund anymore. Our baby babies are all grown up. So measures adopted in 2003, cases brought to the WTO in 2010, and measures revoked in 2011. So as you can see, it's a, in a way uh, attributed to the institutional limitations of the WTO. So as you can see, it's like you, you, visually you can see the rise of Chinese companies. So as you can see, the concern of foreign companies is not only limited to the diminishing access to the Chinese market, now they have to compete with Chinese companies globally. And a lot of state, you know, small and medium-sized wind turbine industries in Europe, are, they're all going uh, bankrupt. So basically, um, so that's the end of the case study. So basic idea that, you know, to summarize is that a lot of political scientists and you know, some you know, trade lawyers, and they argue that WTO is limiting China. But I'm arguing that, well, not necessarily. Developing countries still has operating room under the WTO. And through this convenient compliance, China's industry policies stay ahead of the WTO rule enforcement. And this is not just limited to China. I'm just uh, using China as an example because China is such an important country in terms of trade. But this can be applied to a lot of other countries. So my future research includes Brazil and India and Russia just joined two years ago. So it will be an interesting uh, cross-national comparison. What are the implications? Well, as we all know, the WTO's Doha, Doha round, where the countries get together and you know, you know, revise and set their rules, have been failed. Meaning that there's no changes in the rules in the WTO. So the global trade liberalization has been preceded through litigation and interpretation of WTO rules. But if a big country like China can flout and game the WTO like this, it poses a great challenge for the future of the WTO. Second, rise of state capitalism. State capitalism and industry policy used to carry very negative connotation in American context. Maybe even now today, right? America claims that, oh, you know, they acted like they don't engage in industry policies. However, recently, I went to a lot of different uh, political scientist conferences in America, and there is a section and panel called Industry Policy in America. Mm -hmm. I was like, Industry Policy in America? So I went to the panel, and they basically talk about encouraging United States to use industry policies in renewable energy, rare earth sector, and electronic vehicles, and so on. So, and the you know, World Bank chief economist, now you know, they're, they're becoming a bigger fan of the industry policies. Obama at the State of the Union address, he always emphasized the importance of industry policies to develop renewable energies. So the basic, you know, the final conclusion is that, I think it's just like, you know, food for th thoughts that we can all think about is that in international relations, a lot of people talk about how international institutions socialize China to become a responsible member of the WTO and World Bank and so on. But I'm kind of arguing something provocative, saying that it's China who is, who is socializing the rest of the world. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.